Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Cheryl Reynolds with the UC Statewide IPM program, and welcome to today's UC Ag Expert Talk. And today's talk is on pesticide resistance management of citrus pests. And Peter Cusina is here, and he's going to be running our polls and doing any troubleshooting. Please note that the webinar is targeted to growers and pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods pre presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use by homeowners. And also we wanna say a special thank you to the Citrus Research Board for their support of this webinar series. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we have Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell back today. She's a citrus IPM specialist and research entomologist at the Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center. And today she's going to be speaking on pesticide resistance management of citrus pests. So um, Beth, I'll go ahead and pass this over to you. Great, thank you. Can everybody see it okay? Yeah, we see it. Great. Okay, today I'm gonna to talk to you about pesticide resistance and I'm gonna use citrus pests as my primary example. And first we have to discuss what is resistance. So I'm gonna give you a few basics. And it is the decreased susceptibility of a pest population to a pesticide that was previously effective. And it's inherited, that means it's passed from one generation to the next. So if you're spraying a group of insects, say the green ones are the susceptible ones and the red one somehow manages to develop a genetic resistance to the insecticide, if you spray that pesticide, you're gonna eliminate most of the susceptible ones except those that are perhaps protected in protected places and you're gonna leave behind resistant ones. And then that population is gonna interbreed and you're gonna get some susceptible ones that survive the spray and, and some resistant ones and um, some what we call hybrids or heterozygotes that are sort of mixed. They've got um, resistant and susceptible genes. And if you keep spraying, you're gonna keep eliminating the susceptible green ones and leave behind the fully resistant red ones uh, or the heterozygotes if, if the resistance is dominant. And, um, and that's how you gradually select for resistance to a pesticide. And I wanna talk about some terminology. Sometimes you'll hear the word tolerance and sometimes you'll hear the word resistance. In my mind, tolerance is the natural ability of a population to withstand an, insect, an insecticide. And the example that I use is uh, early in my career, I worked with lacewings and they, for some reason, because they have really high natural levels of esterase enzymes in their bodies, they're tolerant of pyrethroids. And they can, you can, you can't mix up a concentration high enough to kill them. So that is a natural ability of the population. All of them have it. Whereas resistance is something that is uh, a mutation or a change in the population that's genetically inherited and gradually the population shifts over to being resistant. So one is natural and one is sort of unnatural. How do insects develop resistance? Well, they have a couple of different ways they can do it. And I'm, I've put them into very simple categories. There's very complex explanations of enzymes and target sites and things like that. But I'm just gonna give you a few examples so you get an idea that they, they don't always do it one way. There are multiple ways it can happen. They can change their behavior. Um, an example of that is mosquitoes that are hovering, uh, don't touch the insecticides that are on the wall of a building. And so you gradually change the population so most of them hover more than they land. So that's a change in behavior that you've selected for that becomes genetic and established in the population. They can change their cuticle so that the pesticide can't penetrate as easily. Um, again, gradual change in the population. They can increase the number of enzymes they have to detoxify the pesticide, but still maintain their normal function. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. And they can change the nature of the target site that the pesticide is acting on so that the pesticide cannot bind to it. So here's a nerve synapse. When nerve impulses run down the nerve, they, they come into these junctions, these synapses, where they need a chemical called acetylcholine to help make the jump across the synapse. And that chemical moves during the normal activity of a nerve 
um, impulse. And then there's a chemical called acetylcholine esterase, an enzyme that grabs the acetylcholine and moves it back to its original spot. So it's part of the natural process that acetylcholine moves in this picture from left to right and then it gets moved back to the left by the acetylcholine esterase. So these enzymes are very, very important. So what some pesticides do, and in particular organophosphate and carbamate insecticides, um, they bind with this, the acetylcholine esterase and prevent it from doing that job. And what that does is the acetylcholine can't be restored and the insect nervous system just remains in a continuous excited state and it can't function. So that's why, um, that's how organophosphate and carbamate insecticides work to block the acetylcholine esterase and prevent it from doing its job. So one method of resistance is the insect manages to make more acetylcholine esterase. So it's got some that can bind with the pesticide and it's got some that bind with the acetylcholine and return the nerves to normal function. But there is often a fitness cost for that for making these more enzymes in their body, like maybe the insect has a shorter lifespan or it lays fewer eggs, um, and we call that a fitness cost. But in any case, um, this is actually a pretty common way that insects develop resistance to um, the pesticide is they create more enzymes in their body. A second method of resistance is the insect changes the nature of the binding area. So it somehow alters the binding site so that the pesticide can't attach to it, but the, the acetylcholine esterase can. So that's another way that insects get around pesticides. So how do we measure resistance? I'm gonna give the example of California red scale organophosphate resistance monitoring. Um, and in this example, I'm using Lohr's ban. What we do is we take various concentrations of insecticide from low to high. And in our case, for this particular pest, what we did was we would take fruit that were infested with scales and we'd let the little first instar scales emerge. And we would circle them with a black pen and then dip the fruit. And then we'd wait 14 days because scales don't have legs at that stage. So it's really hard to tell who's alive and who's dead. So we wait 14 days for them to molt into the next stage. And if they successfully molt, we call them alive. If they don't make it, then we call them dead. So that's how we developed our original bioassay method. And then we, we take the data, the information, and for example, susceptible scale colony that we have that's never been uh, in the field and never had exposure to insecticides, responds like this. If you look at concentrations between one and 10, by 10 parts per million Lohr's band, you've killed off all the susceptible scales. But if they're resistant scales, they survive quite easily at that concentration and they can survive even up to, I should have made that last number be a thousand. They get closer to a thousand parts per million. So they're clearly surviving a field rate which is around 500 parts per million. So here we've got an example of 70 fold resistance. We look at the fold resistance at the LC50, the point at which we kill 50% of the population. The resistance scales are 70 fold more resistant to, or resistant to the chemical than the susceptible scales. And we can go on and we can say, okay, 10 parts per million is a great number because that would kill all of the susceptible scales but kill hardly any of the resistant ones. And so we can use that as a discriminating concentration and test scales and see how many pop in a population are resistant and how many are susceptible. So that's the way we go about um, bioassaying or testing insect populations to figure out who's alive or dead without having to do a whole lot, a huge number of concentrations. We can use one concentration and we can tell the difference between those that are susceptible and those that are resistant. Now with California Red Scale, one of my technicians, Yuling Uyang, figured out early on that resistant scales have really high esterase enzyme activity. 
And so in this plate, what you see is a standard chemical. You see individual scales that have been squashed up and put in the liquid of these wells. You can see two columns that are resistant, two columns that are susceptible. They all have some esterase enzymes, but obviously the resistant ones have a lot more. And so the, the, the wells color up darker if there's more resistant scale, and we can measure that on a machine. So then we could go out and test field populations just by testing individual scales. We didn't have to go through this long 14-day process. We could just grind up female scales, pop them in, in these wells with these chemicals, and we could tell each pest control advisor what percentage of the scales in their orchard have resistance to the organophosphates and carbamates. We did this in the early 90s um, and we did hundreds of different sites and you can see that um, quite a few sites had high levels of resistance to OPs, meaning uh, probably 78 to 80 percent of the scales that we ground up at that site would show those high levels of esterase enzymes. Some had low resist resistance, which means that um, you know 20 to 50 percent of the scales would show high resistance would show at high esterase enzyme levels. And then we had some scales that were totally susceptible and didn't have high esterase enzyme levels. So we had a mixture of all different kinds of sites. And I think the reason you don't see all out resistance everywhere is because scales don't move very much. And so whatever they're selected based on whatever that grower had been doing in that particular orchard over 20, 30, 40 years of time. But um, that demonstration of resistance to the growers in the 90s convinced them to shift away from OPs and carbamates. Uh, Joe Morris had already shown that there was resistance in thrips and then I showed there was resistance in scales and we introduced some new insecticides, a steam for scale and success for thrips and that reduced the amount of organophosphate and carbamate uh, usage in the San Joaquin Valley by 70%. So it was, it was pretty pretty high. Pretty big change. So I often get asked, well, if we stop using the OPs, will resistance go away in red scale? If a block is a population of red scale, it's fairly uniformly resistant to OPs and carbamates. Resistance doesn't usually decline during the following years. We've sampled some orchards for seven or more years and they continue to have resistance. Why not? Well, probably the resistance is genetically dominant, so all the the red ones and yellow ones, the heterozygotes and the and the um, homozygous resistant ones um, show the resistance. And also scales don't move around much. So the only way you're going to reduce resistance is by bringing in susceptibles that interbreed with the with the resistant ones and slowly but surely work the resistance out. So since scales don't move much, there's nobody for them to interbreed with. And so you're just not going to get that reduction. And then growers continued to use organophosphates for citricola scale control and katydid control. So even though they weren't using them for red scale, they were using them for other pests and that helped to maintain the OP resistance by eliminating any susceptible scales that were in the orchard. So we basically saw that, that uh, resistance did not go away easily in this situation. So just a quick statement about dominance versus recessiveness. Hopefully all of you have had high school genetics and you know, you know enough about those terms to know that susceptible individuals and resistant individuals, when they interbreed, if the resistance is dominant, they're gonna act like the red ones. And if it's recessive or intermediate, they're gonna act more like the susceptible ones. So genetics makes a difference. Let's, let's now talk about another bioassay test that we did. More recently, we've started bioassaying for esteem resistance because it's been used for about 20 years in the San Joaquin Valley on California red scale. And we used the same methods we used originally with the Lors band, but we couldn't do an esterase enzyme test for this because it's an insect growth regulator and it's not the insects would not be using esterase enzymes to break it down. They'd be using some other mechanism. And right now that mechanism is totally unknown. So we went back to dipping fruit that have scales on them into different concentrations of esteem and establishing, okay, what would be a discriminating concentration 
for esteem resistance. And we found that, um, it, again, it was about 10 parts per million esteem should kill all of them and one part per million should kill most of them. So what did we see when we test, when we looked at lots of populations? We did this from 2005 until more recently um, and we never seemed to find more than about 20% survival, so very low levels of resistance in these tests. Um, no trend towards higher survival in recent years, which you would expect to see with increasing resistance. And this suggests that the resistance is not dominant and it's just not, um, it's just not showing itself or the bioassay isn't showing us really how, what insect growth regulator resistance looks like. Like maybe it needs to be a 30 day bioassay and we have to see it go through two molts before we're gonna see the resistance in there versus susceptibility. So we've kind of wrestled with this because we know there's resistance happening out in the field, but we can't seem to really document it very well in the laboratory. And so that's why laboratory bioassays, while they're helpful, are not always the be all and the end all. They, they don't always reveal exactly what's going on in the field. So in laboratory le tests, we're looking for a line that's shifting to the right and it's taking higher and higher concentrations to kill them. But this is just an indicator. In the lab, we're dipping insects and we're doing things that are very artificial. In the field, you're spraying an orchard. Insects are being missed. They're getting less than perfect concentrations. The residues wear off after a while. And so if you're experiencing field applied treatments are working for a shorter and shorter period of time or don't work at all, you've, you've probably got resistance out there. A lot of people say, oh, well, I'm just not spraying it well enough. As soon as you get into that, I'm not spraying it well enough. Everything has to be very perfect. The stars have to be lined up. The moon has to be in the right phase. The spray rig has to be exactly right. As soon as I start hearing that over and over again, I know that resistance is developing in the field because generally the first thing growers experience is that the, the treatments are working for a shorter and shorter period of time. So let me talk about Citricola scale. This is another example where we've done some resistance monitoring. Citricola scale has a really simplistic life cycle. It produces crawler, it lays eggs that hatch into crawlers. The crawlers go out onto the leaves. They sit there for a couple months, then they molt into second instars, move back on the twigs, and then next spring they turn into females. There's no males, so there's no intermating. Um, so, and they have one generation per year. Very, very odd life cycle. So a few years ago, we started looking at, has Citricola scale developed resistance to Lohr's ban? And we took leaves that were infested with citricola scale and we dipped them in clearpyrifos, which is the chemical name for Lohr's band, at different concentrations and we held them for 48 hours and we looked at, you know, were there, were there, we looked for a discriminating concentration basically. Because we didn't have a truly susceptible colony anywhere of citricola scale, we didn't, we couldn't really say, well, a susceptible uh, should die at 10 parts per million or so we, we, we saw a five-fold resistance between some populations we looked at, which is not a super high difference, but it's still significant. And then we said, okay, with the colonies we're playing around with, we should be able to kill them all at 178 parts per million. If they survive that, then they're probably very resistant. You know, the ones we were looking at were somewhat resistant if they're surviving that, they're very resistant. So then we did a whole bunch of populations again. Each one of these histogram lines represents a different population. We looked at 32 populations in 2006, 2007, we looked at 10, 2009, we looked at 48 populations, and 2010, we looked at 57 populations. And we tested them with that discriminating concentration. And about 40% of the populations had pretty high survival between 20 and 75% of that 178 parts per million, which says that we've got a lot of resistance in citricola scale to the Lohr's band. 
um, and it's a problem. So again, we started looking for alternatives, and in this case, the alternatives have tended to be the neonicotinoids like a sale, an ectara, and a imidacloprid. And so you can see when you look at what insecticides have been used for scale control in the San Joaquin Valley in the olden days when I first started in 1990, it was primarily Lorsban superside and 7, or OPs and carbamates. And because of this, the resistances that we've seen in the thrips and then the red scale and then finally the citrus cola scale, those products have generally disappeared from, from usage and red scale is controlled primarily by Movento, Centaur or Applaud um, and Esteem and the Citricola scale is controlled primarily by the neonicotinoids like Acel, Actara, and Admire. So let's talk about citrus thrips resistance to delegate. Delegate's been only used for about 10 years, but its predecessor, Success, who is a sister compound in the same mode of action, has been used uh, for 20 years. So really they've been exposed to that chemical group, the thrips, for about 20 years, which is a really long time for thrips. So for thrips, the resistance bioassay that we developed was we took what we call these munger cells, which are little plexiglass arenas, and we dipped the leaf in the insecticide, let it air dry, and then sandwich it into this munger cell, and then put adult thrips in there. Um, and then we wait 48 hours to see what happens to those thrips. Do they live or die? Again, um, Joe Morris had a susceptible lab colony down in Riverside that pr died pretty much entirely at 0.1 part per million of this delegate. We had a greenhouse colony which came from the field and so had exposure to delegate and so has some levels of resistance and it was taking more like one part per million or more to kill the citrus thrips. So we picked a discriminating concentration of one part per million just to see what thrips populations are doing out there. And we went ahead and did 10 parts per million as well, just to kind of get a look-see and started testing some field populations recently. So there's Joe Morris's susceptible colony. And here are, is the response of San Joaquin Valley populations that we looked at in 2019. We've actually done this for three years, but I'm just showing you the 2019 data. So what you see on the y-axis is the percentage mortality of the thrips at one part per million and 10 parts per million for 14 different sites. And you can see some of them um, have pretty nearly 100% mortality um, and death at 10 parts per million, but some of them don't. Some of those populations, um, and the scariest one is probably population, looks like one, where it has hardly any mortality at one part per million and only about 80% mortality at 10 parts per million. So I, I see this as pretty clear evidence that we've got some resistance problems in the San Joaquin Valley. Resistance is probably edging its way up. It's not may be fully dominant or it's not fully throughout the population because thrips have many generations per year and they move around a lot and they interbreed. So it's probably fluctuating because of that interbreeding, but we definitely have resistance out there. And I'm sure the growers would agree with me that um, the product isn't working like it used to in a lot of situations. So we've got some, what I would say, moderately, resistant populations and some highly resistant populations. So now I'm gonna take a little break for a few questions that uh, Peter is going to give to you. Our first one on our knowledge check is which type of inheritance is the worst case for pesticide resistance? Which one of these is gonna drive pesticide resistance the fastest? Okay, 84% of you are correct. If it's dominant, that's gonna carry it through to the next generation the fastest and the most completely, and that is the biggest problem. Next question. Do you work with any citrus orchards that you think the red scale have developed resistance to esteem? So if you're a master gardener or other, click not applicable. If you have citrus orchards, Tell me if you think the red scale have resistance to esteem. 
Okay, most say not applicable, but about half of the rest of you say that yes, you think you have red scale with resistance to esteem. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Do you work with any citrus orchards that you think the thrips have resistance to delegate? Again, this is more of a just what's your experience and um, letting us know your your levels of concern. Again, uh, huh? Fewer fewer felt that they have resistance to delegate. Okay, than the esteem. That's fine. Next question. What's a discriminating concentration? I've been talking about those a lot. Is that a concentration that kills 50% of the population or a concentration that kills more than 90% of a population or a concentration that's the same as the field rate? How would you define it? Remember, we're trying to discriminate between susceptible and resistant populations with a discriminating concentration. Okay. You all struggled with that one a little bit. It's it's actually the middle answer, a concentration that kills more than 90% of a population. Um, I should have said a susceptible population. But yeah, you're trying to kill most of the susceptibles and if they're resistant, then they they're gonna they're gonna survive that. Okay, I think that's it for the questions at the moment, and I'll just go on with my presentation. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the rate at which insecticides can develop. Um, here's an example of thrips. Thrips develop DDT resistance in like three years, uh, really fast. Dieldrin resistance in one year in the 1950s, Carzol in about six years, Baythroid it took him about five years. Um, Joe Morris has has sampled and, and felt that delegate resistance actually started to uh, appear within four years of the use of that product. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the products completely fail. I know some of you are still using Carzol and Baythroid and Delegate, but it means that they work for shorter and shorter periods of time. So you have to spray other pesticides or spray more frequently with these in order to get the same effect. Um, but just to warn you, citrus thrips can develop resistance very, very fast. The rate of resistance development depends on a couple of things. It depends on whether the, the genetics are dominant or recessive. We've talked about that. It depends on how many genes are involved. Some insects have multiple genes that are helping them with resistance. Um, I can't even begin to go into that. That one's way too detailed. Um, the number of generations for a pest makes a difference. If it's a rapidly turning over pest, it's going to evolve resistance quicker than if it's a slowly uh, reproducing, slowly growing pest. And mobility makes a difference. We've talked a little bit about how thrips are moving between orchards and red scale or not. You need that mobility to interbreed with susceptible insects to reduce resistance. Um, also the persistence of the pesticide residues. A lot of the newer chemicals are very short-lived. They disappear really fast. They're just not there to select for resistance past the one generation you treated. Whereas the older chemistries like um, the organophosphates and uh, chloridane and things like that lasted for many years and we're continuing to select the population continuously. And then the frequency of treatment. And I put a little asterisk next to that one because a lot of these things you're not in control of, but you are in control of how often you use a particular pesticide. And so you have to constantly be aware that you should not be treating frequently with the same chemical category. Okay, so the little um, table at the bottom talks a little bit about the difference in the rate at which OPs and carbamates resistance developed in thrips. It only took, um, a resistance was documented in the 1980s. These products started to be using, being used in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. In the 80s, the thrips developed resistance. In the 90s, red scale developed resistance. And in the 2000s, citricola scale developed resistance. So the red scale and the citricola scale took longer. They have fewer generations per year. And um, that's just a difference between organisms. Um, sometimes I get asked the question, can resistance develop 
to organically approved products? Yes. Um, BT, spinosad, there are many insects that have developed resistance to those particular products, not necessarily in our citrus, more in uh, vegetable crops and cotton and other crops where they're spraying more frequently, but it can happen. They can develop resistance to sulfur. Um, there's a question mark next to pheromones. Probably they can. Eventually you'll get an insect that responds differently to the pheromone disruption and somehow makes its way to the females. Uh, I put a question mark next to oils. It's a smothering agent. It's harder for them to develop resistance, but it could someday happen. So the one advantage of organics is they're so short-lived, it's not a so long select, strong selection pressure. So you see resistance only where they are sprayed very, very frequently. Let's talk about cross resistance. Within the same chemical class, usually the insect has a mechanism of resistance that protects it against any of the chemicals in that group because the pesticide is attacking the same point in the insect. So if it, it develops some kind of barrier or en extra enzymes, it can protect itself against the entire group. So if, if you look at the mode of action group, we have, um, we talked about the carbamates and the OPs are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. We've got pyrethroids, which are sodium channel modulators. We've got butenolides like Savanto, which is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist. And then we've got the spinosins like Success and Trust and Delegate that are uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor allosteric activators. I'll try and say that one fast five times. And we've got the avermectins, which are chloride channel activators, and rhinoids, which are rhinodine receptor modulators like Exeril. And then we've got some things that we don't even know what they do, but they're in another group. We call them, in the case of Veritrine, we call it a botanical. So here are all the chemicals that you could be using against citrus thrips um, and in different groups. And but within those groups, like for example, group five, success and trust and delegate, if you select for resistance to one, you're gonna select for resistance to all three. So you just have to keep that in mind as you're rotating chemicals and thinking about delaying resistance in your particular orchard. Multiple resistance is the term used for superbugs that have multiple mechanisms of resistance and they're protecting themselves against many different insecticide classes all at the same time. For example, Asian citrus psyllid in Florida over the past decade or two has been treated nine to 12 times a year in some orchards to keep its populations down with a whole array of inse insecticides. And there are populations in Florida that are resistant to OPs and carbamates as a group one, pyrethroids as a group three, and neonicotinoids as a group four. So they're superbugs. They have multiple resistance to insecticides. Now, how do I know what insecticide mode of action the, the uh, chemicals I'm working with are in? You can, there's an IRAC, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee makes this poster and they have a website that's shown there that you can go to and you can look up your insecticide and you can figure out what, what mode of action group it's in. So that helps you with managing resistance. You can also look on the label. All the labels now tell what group they're in. So here's an example of XRL is in group 28. That's right there in the pesticide label. And also in the UCIPM guidelines for citrus, every insecticide that's listed in there, we always list the mode of action group number so that you have that readily comparable when you're choosing your insecticides for any particular pest. This happens to be the list for citrus thrips. And you can see I've circled that spinetaram or delegate is a number five, agramec is a number six, and XRL is a number 28 group. So that's how you can tell. So what you're trying to do with slowing resistance is keep your trees healthy, pruned, and watered. Remove shiners, for example, for red scale so that you're not leaving populations in the orchard. Shiners are scale infested fruit. Utilize things like pheromone disruption, natural enemies, 
to try and reduce the population and basically save pesticides as a last resort. And then once you're needing to use those pesticides, use the softest pesticides possible to allow natural enemies to survive and assist with control. Wait to treat until the pests have reached a treatment threshold and rotate rotate between chemicals that have those different modes of action. Um, that to me is the most critical thing in, on resistance management is don't keep using the same chemical over and over and over again or you will select for resistance in your pests. And that's basically it for my presentation. So I will stop share. And I think there might be a couple other poll questions that up for the end here. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So are you bringing them up from your side or should yeah. I put mine back on? Okay. So our first question in the last couple is, which insect develops resistance most rapidly? Is it the citricola scale, the California red scale, or the citrus thrips? Okay, 65% of you are correct. The citrus thrips, in the example of organophosphate resistance, those products were registered in the 1950s. So thrips developed resist solid definable resistance to them in the 80s. So that was after about 30 years, red scale in the 90s, so that was about 40 years, and citricola scale, it took longer than that, more like 50 years. So um, yeah, and that's, those are rough, rough numbers. Next scale, I mean next slide, sorry. What is the most important factor that selects for pesticide resistance? The lifespan of the insect, how often you spray, the mobility of the insect, or the mode of action of the pesticide? What factors should you be focusing on the most? Okay, keep, keep entering your answers. We're almost, we're in the home stretch. 50% um, of you said the mode of action of the pesticide. I really think it's more how often you spray. And I'll, I'll, I'll give citrus as the example. Most growers don't spray any one mode of action very often in citrus. And so it, it takes us a really long time to get to resistance problems. Whereas in veg crops where they're spraying nearly weekly or every couple of weeks, they select for resistance in their pests much, much quicker. So mode of action of the pesticide is important and it's something that you have to keep in mind when you're managing resistance and do as much as possible. But if you use this, if you spray any one of those mode of actions frequently, that's going to get you into more trouble than um, what the mode of action is. So probably I didn't ask this in the best way. I'm thinking, rethinking my question. But anyway, we've had the discussion. Watch how often you spray. Rotate your modes of action. Both of those answers are really good. Which two insecticides are in the same mode of action group? For some of you, this might be difficult. Um, so Cheryl, if they don't answer the question, um, we probably should have put an I don't know in there for the master gardeners and the others. Um, but if you get a significant number of people answering, go for it and move on to the next one. So which two insecticides are in the same mode of action group? Okay, most of you said delegate and success, which is correct. Those are the two that are in the same uh, mode of action group. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and take some questions? Okay, yeah, and we have uh, several that have come through. Um, so the first one is, where does ACP fall in the resistance spectrum? Well, that's an interesting one, and I should have used that as my example of frequency versus mode of action. Right now in Brazil, they're treating Asian citrus psyllid 24 times a year. In Florida, until recently, they were treating nine to 12 times a year. In California, we treat two to three times a year. So you can imagine that Brazil's Asian citrus psyllid probably has some pretty hefty levels of resistance. Florida's got problems and we would have less problems because fewer problems because we are not treating as often. And 
when you get up to treating 12 times a year, you by default have to spray the same mode of action more than once because you're running out of options. So I think resistance can develop in Asian citrusylate. I don't expect it to be here at this point. Um, Joe Morris did some baseline studies of Asian citrusylate a couple years ago, so we would have a baseline from which to measure. And, um, but as I said, I don't see my growers treating with the same modes of action more than twice a year, and that's not a very strong selection pressure. Okay, and then the next one, are systemic pesticides more likely to develop resistance? If they're persistent. Um, some last longer than others. The Verimark and the Platinum are kind of short-lived. They get into the plant really quickly, but then they disappear pretty quickly versus imidacloprid, which can last in, in trees for three months or longer. Yes, systemics are going to provide a continuous selection pressure over multiple generations. And so that is going to select for resistance more than a product that's a foliar that breaks down more quickly. But in a situation like Asian citrusylid, where you're trying to prevent insects from existing at all and spreading a disease, there are trade-offs. You know, you need the greater, more persistence to get more of the population. So what I get concerned about is when Florida first had the Asian citrusylid, their method of protecting young trees was to put in low rates of neonicotinoids alternating between the neonics, but they were all in the same class, um, same mode of action, uh, alternating them constantly so that their young trees perpetually had low levels of neonics in them all the time. So they were basically setting up for the worst case scenario for selecting for resistance, um, continuous application of neonics. Okay, a um, uh, question on the definition. Um, would resistance become tolerance over time um, if the resistant trait is passed on? Not in my mind. In my mind, tolerance is an innate uh, ability that the insect or weed or whatever had to begin with. Um, it's not something, what they become is more resistant over time or more purely resistant. You have a population, you have lots of individuals. Some of them have high levels of resistance, some low, some medium, some aren't resistant at all, they're interbreeding constantly, uh, it's a population. So as time goes on and you keep selecting that population, you're just making it more and more purely resistant. You're eliminating the uh, weak ones, the susceptible ones, and making a, a just a purely resistant population. Okay, uh, with the loss of chlorpyrifos, what are your suggestions for alternative materials to control California red scale? Uh, mating disruption lures seem to be effective, but hard to monitor and evaluate. We have been doing some work with the pheromones for red scale, and I think that's huge. It it's, doesn't perfectly control them, but it it has a huge impact. And so that combined with an occasional spray and all the other things that you need to do to manage red scale is really gonna to help to moderate populations. In the early 90s, growers were spraying three, four times a year with OPs and carbamates for red scale and thrips and they couldn't get control of any of the populations. We got a new set of chemicals that were shorter lived and more selective and allowed natural enemies to survive and everything calmed down for many years. And now we're getting into this weather pattern that's really driving thrips and red scale and growers are getting back into spraying, you know, three, four times a year for red scale and a couple of times a year for thrips and, and running through all the chemicals. And, and to me, that's really scary. You need to do whatever you can do to, to reduce the number of sprays. And so while pheromones may seem complicated, uh, they can help with that reduction of, of the number of sprays you put on per year and get things back into a, a more normal pattern. Okay, uh, the next one. Is there any evidence of citrus thrips resistance to sabadilla in California? I don't think anyone has ever checked for sabadilla resistance. It would be a hard one to prove. Um, and so, no, I can't answer that question. I mean, it's possible, but it's not used very often. 
and it's very short-lived chemical. So I, I have a feeling it would not, if there is some, it wouldn't be very high levels of resistance. It would be very subtle. Okay, uh, some PCAs favor using a cocktail of insecticides with different mode of actions over rotation between them. What is your opinion on this philosophy? I think that works really well for, for pathogens and weeds, but I, I prefer for insects that products be alternated rather than combined. Um, partly because with insects, I want to see, like for example with red scale, let me use that as an example, there are four or five generations of red scale. If you make a cocktail, you're only hitting one generation. If you alternate, you're hitting two generations. So you're getting more through time and you're sort of hitting them with different products at different times. So you're not selecting, I don't know, I just worry about selecting for the superbug. Now, by, by giving them cocktails all the time, because a lot of times the mixtures, the premixes, um, have one component that's lower than you would normally, lower concentration than you would normally apply. Um, and you're not in control of it. You're not in control of the concentration. So I think, I think for insects, alternating is, is better. Now the exception to that rule, and we're doing some studies on this, is organic products. Since organic products are so short-lived, you, you have to spray them constantly in order to have any kind of residual effect. They work great if they hit the insect directly, but if the insect is missed, uh, the residues disappear so fast that the insect population can rebuild. Um, some of the growers are finding that mixtures of organics are working better in terms of creating a little bit longer persistence of the product. Um, so in that case it may it may be something that that is actually really beneficial but we need to do some more research to establish which combinations make the difference. And um, this question came in, and I think it's just related to what you just answered, but I'll ask anyway. Um, do you recommend mixtures of insecticides to delaying resistance? I don't. I recommend spray as infrequently as possible, but and use rates that you know are going to kill the insects. Some people want to use low rates for some reason, probably for cost reasons, or so they can use the chemical again later. I say hit insects hard knock them out as best you can, and then you're not likely to have to come back and treat them again, and then you're reducing the frequency with which you're using the chemical. And so to me, that's the best way to handle the situation. Okay, we have a couple more here. Um, will spraying trap crops cause significant resistance? I don't know a situation in citrus where we're doing trap crops. If they're maybe thinking in terms of like Asian citrus psyllid. Yes, I think eventually it would. Um, say you were growing, I don't know, curry, curry leaf or, or Morea paniculata next to your orchard to try and draw Asian citrus psyllid out uh, and then spraying it to kill them. Um, I think you could, if they're living on that plant and coming back to it, you could possibly select eventually for resistance if you use the same chemical over and over again. One of my concerns, uh, they want to create trap crops that have Bt in them, a Bt toxin, and that would kill psyllids that land on it so they'd be attracted and then killed when they land and feed. That probably will select for resistance eventually. I mean insects are just able to do that eventually, given enough time and enough selection pressure. Okay, um, and can you list again the organic products for citrus thrips? Uh, for citrus thrips, it would be Veritran or Sabadilla. I'm not sure if that's still available organic or not. You'd have to check. It used to be, but I have this feeling it's not anymore. And then uh, Entrust would be the other organic product. Okay, and then one more just came in. Um, Often combining the insecticide with non-insecticidal tank mix partners like fertilizers reduces the potency. The use of what is in essence a less than effective rate promotes the development of resistance. Do you agree? 
I would agree with that. So you need to be really careful. Um, some chemicals, insecticides are very sensitive and some are not. Some are affected by pH and yeah. So you, as I said earlier, you wanna make the application as effective as possible so that you don't have to come back and treat again. And that is the best way to manage resistance in addition to rotating the chemicals. So at this time, I think we've um, answered all of our questions, Beth. So thank you for presenting today. It and was my pleasure. I want to thank everybody for attending and hope everybody will be back at our next one next month. And that registration um, link is open now for the next month's webinar. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank I you, Beth. It.